like to welcome you to the Julie Rose Show today. I have my friend Eric helping us, and also my friend Joel, who's going to be guiding some of the questions we have today. Today's topic is what I see in the United States. We're going to focus on a, a few of the regions in the United States and start out there and see where we go. Joel, welcome. How are you today? Great, Julie. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Eric, how are you? We'd like to welcome you as well. Doing great. It's good to be here. Thanks again for your help on everything. Um, I'm pretty excited about this this podcast because um, there are so many things that I see around the world and particularly in the United States. And I've had um, thousands of emails come in and several hundred emails specifically asking questions about what I see around the world and in the United States in particular as far as, far as everything for, from where the foreign troops will come in, the type of warfare we're going to be involved in, the natural disasters, plagues, and other things. Also, the topic of the gathering, which we recorded and will continue to record regarding the topic of the gathering and the mission of the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund. So today's broadcast is going to be focusing on questions that Joel has relative to what I see in the United States. Like the other podcasts, I do not have any preconceived notions or preconceived ideas or questions coming at me in advance. We decide the topic based on the person who's interviewing me or asking the questions. They pick the topic, and then we go from there following the spirit. And so it's, it's kind of exciting. I always like doing these because I find that I get more clarity and more understanding. It solidifies my testimony, and I learn a little bit more about what my mission is along the way. Joel, I'm going to turn the time over for you. And go ahead and ask your first question. Hi, Julie. So what I wanted to do is start in Alaska and kind of work our way down. Um, so if you could start just by talking about some of what you see happening up there in, uh, in Alaska and then maybe just kind of wander our way down the United, to the United States. And, uh, okay. We'll so the north, there. Like the northeast area? Correct. Okay, we'll do that. I'll throw a little bit of Canada in there on the west coast of Canada, British Columbia, Vancouver, going into Seattle, and over to Boise. We'll we'll talk about Oregon. Well, let's start with that. Thanks for that question. Um, I've had a lot of people actually email me and ask me um, at events and things what I see for Alaska because I've not spoken on Alaska or Hawaii for the most part, and I didn't travel to either of those states when I was doing my speaking engagements and really didn't hit those regions. Alaska, as you know, is the largest state in the United States of America. It's larger than Texas, and a lot of people forget about Alaska because they're isolated and separate from the United States as they're far up north. Um, what I see there is also invasion from the Russians into Alaska. In fact, they have ports and areas that are just out of Alaska, and they will um, try to try to take over Alaska, essentially. And uh, with the coastal, coastal waters there, I also see um, several earthquakes up in Alaska and some very big earthquakes that will cause um, large waves. And some of, the, some of the land would be broken off there and for crevices and other deep, deep um, areas to be made on, on that part of the continent. Uh, I also see a lot of people from Alaska coming over into Canada as they flee some of those natural disasters and or foreign troops. Um, many people go into the mountains there, just like they go into the mountains and other places in the world. But due to the cold weather, they're used to living in the cold weather, but the extreme conditions seem to be more extreme as um, natural disasters take place. There are actually some, some mountainous areas that have volcanoes that will erupt. And um, just like everywhere else in the world that I see, they are going to be greatly impacted and affected by these natural disasters as well as war. I see Alaska or, or the coast of Alaska where they will have um, Russian ships. The Chinese will come in there as well. They'll come into Vancouver and British Columbia area. Already they have taken hold on that, on that island. If you go into the center of Vancouver Island, you see that there is a large um, – population of the Chinese immigrants that have come in, and they are buying up land like crazy in that, that part of Canada. So um, that's 
that's basically what I see for that part of Alaska and for that part of Canada. Going clear over into Edmonton and uh, Calgary, Alberta, and over to Cardston, uh, Cardston, Canada. Cardston is a place of safety. It will become a, what we call a city of light, as will other places. Cardston has a beautiful LDS temple there. It will serve as protection for some of the saints. And then some of those saints will come on down doing missionary work and rescue missions into the United States and the other way around. Some of our, of our members of, um, the United States will go into the Carson area to do rescue missions as well. Focusing on the upper United States of the state of Washington and the state of Oregon, I see mass exodus of people coming first in, in the first wave of the gathering, going west into the Boise area and on over into the other parts of Idaho, like Twin Falls and the greater Rexburg area. Many of those initial gatherings from Washington State and Oregon into the Boise, greater Boise, Idaho area. And then later on, those that do not flee or gather early on, I see due to natural disasters, everything from Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier erupting, and the foreign troops coming in as we go into war, I see thousands of people fleeing on foot with sometimes barefoot and only the clothes on their back with a small backpack or nothing at all, with children on their back, similar to what is referred to in the scriptures if you read about um, about people in the last days in the tribulations fleeing with nothing on their backs. That is a visual that I get time and time again, especially for the state of Washington and also for the state of Oregon. In respect to that, the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund is preparing places in the greater Boise area and in the, the rest of Idaho, specifically the Rexburg area, for these refugees. Um, these visions that I've had of just the state of Washington alone have caused me such sorrow and anguish and anxiety over the years um, that I'm very, very motivated to provide several safe, safe houses in the Ashton, Idaho, greater Rexburg area, and that's what we're actively working on because I see not only thousands, but eventually about a million people in that valley coming everywhere from Wyoming, to Washington, from Oregon, and from the Wasatch area of Utah, coming up to the greater Rexburg area. Oregon is much the same as Washington. You've got Portland and Seattle that will be inundated with plague. And um, the vials that I talk about in my books and the gallon-sized containers of basically biological weapons, both Portland and Seattle are two of the cities that will have those vials poured in particularly Seattle being the main one that will spread on over into the, into the rest of the United States. Same with Salt Lake. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but Salt Lake is another place that I've seen will be inundated with that same gallon-sized container. Um, I see huna uh, tsunamis at both of those places. The Ring of Fire will come alive, affecting Washington, Oregon, and California significantly on mass scale, so that parts of those coastlines are completely deteriorated and ripped off and separated from the rest of the continent. Um, I don't know. Do you have any questions about that? Does that spur any other questions that you might be interested in learning about that area? Um, no, I, I think that's a pretty good description of what's, what's happening. Why don't we just keep moving down the, the coast to okay. Northern California, then Southern California. and Okay. Northern California, I see um, there will be Russian troops that will come into Northern California and the Sacramento area, some going as far south as San Francisco, but they will come in. They, they essentially divide up so that the majority of the Russians come in initially as um, and missiles. I see thousands of missiles being launched from the ocean, um, and they'll have, they'll have um, missiles coming into the mainland of the United States from the oceans and from air, they will they will trigger those. I see angelic forces, as well as our own forces, fighting against those missiles and other types of bombs, including nuclear bombs that are being let off in some of those larger cities. Um, although it's mass chaos, what most people don't realize, because their eyes are veiled from the spiritual realm, they don't realize how much angelic intervention is is at our disposal, and because of that, the damage is not nearly as much as it would have been 
had all of them actually gone off. I see most of those missiles actually being um, detonated or, or uh, the bombs being detonated, but then not, um, like in some cases, due to priesthood power, they're redirected back out into the ocean so that instead of hitting the land, they go out into the ocean. Now, make no mistake, damage is expensive, but not nearly what it would have been had there not been divine intervention from the light side. Given this is going to be a mass war on the land, the sea, and in the air, and um, on a spiritual level, the warfare that increases as the tribulations begin and the portals of dark and the portals of light open up, both of those forces on the spiritual realm becoming so intense that when our men and women um, in our armed forces or, or those fighting against the invasion troops are actually there, they don't realize most of the time, 99% of the time, they have no clue what's going on in the spirit world and how much protection they are given. So we don't lose nearly as many of our troops as we would have otherwise. And the, the whole goal of the Russians and the Chinese is to take over our land with out totally ruining the infrastructure so that they can enslave us and they can take over the land and everything that is of value. So they don't want to totally destroy America. They want to do that with the least amount possible, but get rid of the infrastructure so that they can build their own, including things like EMPs. So I do see an EMP in the United States and Alaska and Canada with concentrated efforts in the large cities, the EMP causing complete blackout and blackness for a period of uh, time that I'm not allowed to disclose, but it's long enough that you need to be willing and able to live for about a year without electricity, if not longer. In some areas, it won't be that long. Some areas will be a matter of days or months. In some areas, they don't ever get their electricity back, but that provides essentially later on clean, clear circuits that have been blown where we can then one day, as we go into millennium, have pure energy and um, that is something that's being developed as we speak. Pure energy that will be brought back to us. We could take those EMP circuits and start from scratch with clean, clear, light energy. Then we have, going down the coast of California, uh, like I said, Sacramento and San Francisco, those two cities being inundated with plague, also tsunami. The foreign troops coming in on mass scale, mostly the Russians coming in to Sacramento and the Chinese and the Russians taking, actually kind of fighting over San Francisco a little bit because that's such a big city um, of significance. But I see Sacramento um, having a tsunami as well as earthquake and volcano. Then also the San Francisco area, not only being inundated by plague on a, a massive scale, that city is hit harder than some of the other cities in the United States and a cleansing that has to take place. And because of that, the entire coastline is ripped from the shore because the tsunami does so much damage that it covers a large portion of the earth on that coastline. Um, we see an increase in dangerous waters, including an increase in sea life that comes ashore, including the great white sharks, which have already started, more of those coming inland. The um, Earthquakes and tsunamis that happen out there in southern, or excuse me, northern California increase. Volcanoes increase. They come alive. Some that have been dormant increase. And we see both fractures in the earth and in the sea on the land under the sea. Um, I see uh, there are LDS temples out there. We have the Oakland Temple. A visual that I've been given of the LDS Oakland Temple is that the temple survives but it is essentially sitting on top of an island. So anyone that knows the topography out there, if you're thinking about San Francisco, I hope you're a good swimmer because if you are out there when this huge tsunami comes in, the it will flood so much of that area out there. I see those streets that are so um, hilly essentially being flooded so that the tops of the streets in some areas of San Francisco are able to eventually be above water, but because of how steep they are, it makes it even worse on the flooding side because the water just sits and it has nowhere to go and it just stays there and shops and businesses are completely destroyed. I need to take a break. Do you have any questions on that? That's a lot right there. That is a lot. 
that is a lot. So I think it's interesting that that essentially what what's happening um, as they come in is that is that it has this polarizing effect where right. if your if your heart leans more towards light or darkness, if we want mm-hmm. to put it in that kind of a perspective, it just it you you either feel a pull to the light and it and it helps you come closer to God, or right. you feel feel a, a pull towards the darkness, and that's essentially what you know there there will be no more fence sitters that's absolutely correct that's how i see it as well san francisco is a good city for that example because there are a lot of people that are really really good in san francisco there's a high population of of christians in san francisco and there's also a high population of people who have completely turned their hearts and minds and thoughts away from god and um, as a tender mercy from the lord He will cleanse that area, and I say tender mercy because he loves all of his children, and to keep them from further condemnation, he will simply wipe them from this earth, end their mortal ministry, and send them on to the other side of the veil to continue in their progression so that they don't damn themselves any more than they already have. They can continue to progress on the other side of the veil, whereas if they were here in mortality in their body, continuing to do some of of the evil acts that they're doing, they... um, they would further condemn themselves. So as an act of mercy, he removes them from the mortal body, away from the temptations of the adversary, away from the entities that are plaguing them, and he takes them to the other side so that they can continue in their progression. And they will then have a choice while they're on on the earth as well as as they go into the um, eternal spiritual realms to choose if they want to go to the light, to choose if they want to accept Christ, to, to, to choose if they want to continue on a light path, or if they want to continue in darkness. Right, and I think to clarify, you know, and to help people understand, you know, when when we say light or dark, uh, you know, uh, when we get pulled towards the light, we're actually becoming more selfless. And right. and and to see somebody who who is has light within them, the things that they'll be doing is helping their neighbor, caring for others, sharing what they have. Um, right. you know, those type of acts that Christ would do if he was on the earth. Right. And when we say darkness, I think it's good to define that those type of people will be greedy and wanting to steal from others and take and and mm-hmm. and, and necessarily, you know, kill people so that they have more. And, right. and so when we say light and dark, it's good to kind of define and just say, listen, if we are light, we are doing acts that help others, and we are selfless. I agree with you. Thank you, Joel. I see that brings me to the next point of what I see in every large city, San Francisco being an example. Again, because the plague will send rapidly, everything from lice to rats and mice and other pestilence will spread, including ticks, will spread the plague, and it will be as bad or worse than the days of the of the Black Plague in um, previous days past. And that actual plague will come back, as well as a myriad of other plagues. There's going to be more than a handful of plagues that will be spreading. They'll mutate. They've already scientifically developed these plagues in the lab. Some of them are spiritually created and have not yet been physically manifested, and others are physically manifested and created on the earth already. They've already taken some of the mice and rats. They've injected them and they're waiting to release them into the public. They know that these animals mass produce. They've already released some of them, and and that's why we have things like Ebola and other things that are still surfacing. It is a lie that Ebola has been eradicated, and it's a lie that that was started. They purposely injected people in Africa with the Ebola virus, and that is how they got it to begin with, and that's not something that is being reported. They have brought that to the United States. They're testing the waters on it. We don't hear about it because the media has, has been bought and sold by the what I refer to as, as the Gadiantans, which is something I've learned in the Book of Mormon. The term Gadiantan is basically a high, um, high level, everything from a high level conspiracy to um, anybody who is basically enlisted in Satan's cause. And these Gadiantans, have enlisted scientists, they've enlisted doctors, they've enlisted politicians, they've enlisted um, just about everybody in their cause within every system of government and within churches and communities 
and they are conspiring to kill and destroy and hurt and injure innocent Americans. And not just Americans, but people around the globe. It is very wicked, it's very dirty, it's very planned, and it's been planned for decades. Going back to clear in 1913, when some of these welfare programs and other things were coming to fruition, this is, this is the, is how far back it's gone in the United States, which is one of the most modern socialistic things that include, you know, Soros and some of the others. That stuff is real, folks. Some of it sounds outlandish, some of it is outlandish, and some of the most outlandish stuff that's going on in the United States or that we don't hear about or will hear about is absolutely true. And, um, when it comes to the plagues, there are ways that you can clear yourself out of plagues. And I've um, been learning some of that. And we, we won't take the time to go into that. But first and foremost, what people need to know is if it's according to the plan, you're going to go to the other side of the veil. And if it's not, you'll stay. And God will make it available for you how you can endure that plague. But um, it is something that we need to be aware of and we need to caution people about. And they need to be getting getting things in order in their homes. Not everyone can or will go to um, places of safety in the middle of Idaho or Utah or New Mexico or other places that are being set up that are more isolated from the large population. A lot of people, in fact, most of the people in the United States will not be in a position to leave. They will be stuck in the cities. And that is where with mass concentrations we have more entities, we have more unclean spirits, we have more people that that um, are on mass transit systems and other places where devastation can occur because we have terrorist activities, we have marauders, we have rapers, and we have people who are interested in self-aggrandizing. And so that's when you're talking about darkness. Darkness will prevail in those cities for a time. And that leads me into the topic that we're going to do a, po- a podcast on that I'm excited about. We're going to record this one next week um, and have it go out sometime in the next couple weeks, excuse me, a couple weeks after after this podcast. And we're going to do a topic based on rescue missions and what I see for rescue missions and the heroes that are going to be in this country. I think that's going to be a cool podcast. Nice. Yeah, that will be. I, I think I think it's good to make a note right here. You know, we we talk about you've been talking a lot of chaos and things that that will be happening that will cause people to have a lot of fear and anxiety, it's important to remember that that the author of that fear and anxiety is Satan and is evil. And to help combat that, really essentially we have to have peace. Even in the midst of chaos, we, we need to have peace and produce that from within ourselves with the help of the Lord. If you look at his life, Christ's life, you know, there was much chaos around him, and yet he was able to have peace, and through that peace and love that he had in his heart, he was able to overcome and escape a lot of things. If we take that as our example, we can do the same things, whether we're in San Francisco or in Oregon or, or wherever you're at, you know, the light side will be there to help you, the, the, the spirits that are good are out there to help. Right. And if we can remain calm and keep Satan away from us, in other words, keep away that anger and that anxiety and ask for that peace, we can find strength to overcome many, many things. And that's where people will find their power to overcome and to survive and to help others. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. I love that. Because I see darkness on the earth, but I see light portals opening, and I see light, everything from angelic, translated, transfigured, and resurrected beings on this planet now, and coming in in tenfold to help us when the tribulations do start, whether we realize that's what they are or not. I have um, been privileged to meet some of these individuals. That might sound crazy, but that is the truth. That is my truth. I have met some of these individuals in real life, flesh and blood, talking to them, face-to-face, and I'm here to tell you they're real, and they will help. I've had a lot of angelic ministration. I have it every day. They remind me constantly that we are not alone. The Lord has a plan, and if we have faith in his plan, 
that we believe that everything is for our good, nothing's coincidental, and even the worst tragedies that occur in our lives and on this earth, if we allow them to, will help us become better, stronger, more noble men and women who can follow the Lord and build his kingdom here and into the eternities. And in building his kingdom, we build ours. And that is a doctrine that is true, it's a doctrine that is real, and it's a doctrine that I know and I testify and witness of, that as we seek to glorify God, we then are being able to increase in our understandings, increase in our power, and we increase in our knowledge and education, everything from spiritual warfare to what it's like to live in a a spiritual realm and a physical realm that absolutely are unified and tied together. You cannot separate the two. And and the more I go through difficulty, the more adversity I have, the more convinced I am of that. God is allowing me to learn what it's like to be about, about him and his work and to learn what it's like to be like him by suffering, by grieving, by expanding my knowledge and my um, sensory experiences, And it absolutely is a beautiful plan. It's a hard plan. It is a hard plan. It is so hard, but it is worth it. And I witness and testify, it is worth it, you guys. We cannot give up in this fight against the adversary. And if we look at our Savior as our exemplar, and and we look at the patterns, this is this is a part of the plan. To, he overcame all things because he went through all things. Yes, and if yes. we are attempting to follow Christ, then we it's only natural to look at that pattern and go, all right, then what's next? What's next is we, we go through these hard things and we need to overcome them as well. Right. And it's, you know, it's, there's no need to be scared. There's only need to have faith because truly believing in Christ, truly believing in him, is understanding that we will go through those things and that it is a part of our plan to do that so that we can progress and become more like him. I agree with you 100%, Joel. I wanted to ask some more about what I see happening in in Northern California because we talked for a minute about how people in in the Northwest will come into the Boise, Idaho area and on over um, as you look at the highways and break it up. One of these days, I think it would be good, Eric, if we can put some maps up and do a podcast specifically with maps where I can show people on the maps and we can outline what I see with where certain natural disasters will take place. I'm not going to be all inclusive because that's impossible to do, but I would love to be able to show people in real time on a map, like you and I have talked, where some of those those goods are that we're going to store so people know where they can go for safety later on. I, I'm not going to give specifics because I don't want to let the enemy know where I've got my safe houses, but I want to be able to give people a general idea of the regions involved and where I see those foreign troops coming in and where they can avoid disaster, like on the main highways, you know, being careful on, on Highway I-15 or... Um, some of those other main highways that come into the Wasatch and things like that. When we go um, to the Northern California area, I see mass exodus. Again, many people coming on foot. They'll start out in cars or, or motor vehicles. They'll run out of gas. The traffic will be too hard. Or they'll get blocked off with checkpoints. They're blocked off from out to disasters, mudslides, and other things. And so they'll end up on foot, a lot of them, coming through mountain passes or elsewhere through deserts and other dis- Um, discouraging circumstances and from Northern California coming in in, and some of them coming in from Nevada on over through Royal Gorge into the the greater St. George, Utah area. A large majority of the people coming from California in up through and even those from Arizona also coming up through into the great St. George area. North of St. George also another huge gathering place with about a million people in that valley. So we've got that area, I also see huge impacts on the San Pete Valley. That's near Manti, Utah. There's going to be about a million people in that valley one day. So mass exodus, if you just think about people coming from the coast, going inland, and imagine if you're living in that area and you are needing to help rescue people, there is going to be a huge need. I I ask that if you are hearing this right now, 
go to my website, julierowprepare.com, learn more about the books that I've written, learn more about my mission with the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund. Go into the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund. Check out our website at www.greatertomorrowfund.org, and you will see what our mission is. This is specific to people in this area. Mass exodus. If you have friends and family in that area, I encourage you to donate money or to donate your time and resources. We are looking for safe houses in these cities and in these places and in these regions so that we can put supplies, we can stock up, we can have things ready so that when natural disasters or the foreign troops come in, we have safe houses where we can have these people who have been displaced come and get supplies. This is a huge effort. We need your help. We need volunteers. And we are going to be very selective in who our volunteers are. We do background checks on people, and we will be very selective, especially with who I trust in these safe houses and with the confidential information to make sure that we are having um, people who are of the light, people who are going to share their supplies and their food instead of hoarding it, and that we can protect from marauders and other people. We have a system in place for that. If we go down to... Southern California, again, I see people from Southern California. The first troops that land, every time I'm shown this in vision, the first troops that land, the Russians come into, into Seattle just about the same time, if not close, into Portland, and the Chinese come and they, they first hit the San Francisco, excuse me, the LA area, then San Francisco and San Diego at about the same time. But the first first boots on the ground that I see through paratroopers and then the ships that come in are the Chinese that come into Los Angeles. They come on mass scale. There's thousands of them, thousands and thousands that come in and they come in to the Los Angeles area. Um, as you can imagine with LA being the way it is and how traffic is already, it's going to be nearly impossible at that time for people to get out of the LA area they will be stuck there in transit because they'll run out of gas. You can you can see on the news when we've had like Hurricane Katrina and other or other disasters how hard it was for people to get gasoline. The lines were super long. They ran out of gas. They only took cash. So if you do not have cash on hand, emergency cash, I encourage you in the sound of my voice to get some emergency cash. You should always have cash anyway. It's foolish if you do not have emergency cash. If you can only afford 20 bucks, keep 20 bucks in your wallet in one. But you need to have at least 20 bucks of cash on hand. You know, maybe you don't want to carry that much cash in your wallet because you're in a high crime area or something. But you want to keep cash where you can have access to it. And people have asked about things like, should I get silver and gold? You know, the dollar is going to collapse, but, but you're going to want cash and people will still take it for a while. And you're going to need to have have cash to be able to get gasoline or bread or water from the grocery stores at least for a few days before they run out. Within a matter of two to three days, the, the store shelves will be cleared out. The gasoline, they won't, they won't be delivering gas to the gas pumps anymore. So there's a lot there. I would be, I would be stocking up on, at first, uh, uh, at least a, a two or three week supply of food in your pantry with Things like bread, water, um, you know, necessities that you usually eat on a regular basis. We're not talking about a year's supply of wheat or 30 years' supply of wheat or any of that. I'm talking about what do you eat every day or every couple of days that if the grocery stores were to go down and you had no way to go get groceries, that you could survive for at least two weeks. And I would start there. All right. And it's important, I think it's important to note on that is that you really need to follow the Spirit. In other words, pray and ask the Father, you know, right. what do I need specific for my, you know, for my preparations right. for these right. things that may be coming. And for each person, it's going to be something necessarily different. Not everybody is going to have the same you know, the same mission or things that they need to do to help provide for themselves and for others. That's true. And we need people in place. If you were essentially foreordained to be in a certain city or a certain location when this stuff takes place, then you don't go anywhere else. 
you stay where God tells you to stay, and you stay and you help and you serve and you do what you need to do, and you have courage and you have faith to do that very thing. You know, um, I don't think there's any reason for us to be afraid or to be panicked about what's coming if we're doing everything we know that God wants us to do then we can endure whatever we need to, right? I mean, I'm not afraid. I don't like what I see. I'm not happy about it. Um, I used to be afraid. I used to have severe anxiety. I'd wake up in a panic because I was being shown something that was so dark and so scary that it, it made me fearful. But I'm, I don't live in fear. I have courage. I'm encouraged. I have joy in my life. And I'm excited excited for when we get through the crappy stuff because the greater tomorrow is so good, you guys, whether you're on this side of the veil or the other side of the veil, it is so good. I can't tell you that enough. It is so good that you will never regret being in the right place at the right time doing the right things. I testify of that. It is so joyful and so happy and so light that you are going to want to be a part of that. And you're going to want to work as hard as you can to get there, whether you're on this side of the veil or the other side of the veil. But especially if you're on earth and you make it through these tribulations, I promise you it will be worth everything you've gone through. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that. You know, it's we really need to understand and know in our hearts and really believe the message of Jesus Christ. Because essentially that's, that, that's what it is. If we want to boil it down, that all these things that we're talking about are just helping those that are listening to this, helping them to understand that if they have fear and anxiety, that is coming from Satan. Recognize that and ask the Lord to take it away. Ask him for peace. That is the way that you can combat Satan's armies, his fiery darts, his fiery darts are those negative emotions, that darkness that we feel. And we can get rid of that simply by asking our Heavenly Father to remove it from us and to give us that faith in Christ's message so that we can overcome those fiery darts of the adversary. And really, that is the biggest battle to overcome. Because once you overcome that darkness, overcome that fear and anxiety, you can essentially have that faith to know that everything that you do is according to the plan of our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. And as we do those things in faith, we will have confidence and light and peace. And that is a peace that cannot be given to you by anybody else. It is our own individual responsibility to seek the Lord and seek that peace. Nobody else can stand between you and the Lord and say, oh, here's some peace. It is individual, and we can talk about it, and we can share, but we can't give it to anybody else. We can only show right. them the way, and right. they have to accept that light. Right. Thank you. I've been accused of instilling fear by writing these books and talk about this message, but what I would like to say to that is, if you saw what I saw, you would do everything in your power too, I think, to motivate people to get that peace. Because I didn't create this. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not that creative to be able to come up with these stories. I, I just know that I've been asked to help wake people up so that they can understand the condition upon which we find ourselves so that they can turn to the Lord. Because turning to the Lord is what gives you the peace. And then you can go through anything. I've been through some hard things in my life, and the only thing that has healed my heart, kept me alive, and continues to motivate me to live is because I've turned to the Lord, and I continue to turn to him. He is absolutely the one true king. He's the way to go, and that is where you find rescue to your soul. Um, Eric, do you have anything to say? You want to turn it to you for a minute? Sure. Thanks, Julie. And Joel, great comments, great questions. Thanks, both of you. The thing that's coming to my mind is you've talked about some of the events coming, like earthquakes, volcanoes, foreign troops, plague, whatever. Is uh, I keep going back to Isaiah, and 
several places in the scriptures, Isaiah mentions words like flee, fled, forsake. And um, there's. I just wanted to point out to those who like to read and tie these things to the scriptures that I can count right now on this piece of paper in front of me six or seven really good scriptures that talk about a, a great forsaking that will take place in the last days. And if you look at that word forsake, it just means to basically to turn your back on something and walk away from it. And mm-hmm. I think Isaiah saw the things you're talking about when he talks about people fleeing and forsaking and um, homes are left uninhabited. And I just wanted yes. to see if you had any insight on this. Do you, do you think that that is the appropriate scripture for the things you've been talking about? Yes. Yes, both John the Beloved, John the Revelator, and Isaiah saw exactly what we're talking about. I know this because I have had interactions with them. I still have interactions with them. They have continued to tell me and remind me that I am on the Lord's mission, essentially in modern days, playing a role similar to those in their day that were asked by the Lord to witness and testify of um, end of days. And not end of the world, but end of days as we know it. And Isaiah absolutely saw exactly what we're talking about. Um, he has written beautiful prose. It's difficult for some people to understand, but that's because it requires that you have the Spirit of the Lord to decipher what he's talking about. And absolutely he saw what we're talking about. Um, do you have a list of those scriptures? Can you read them off for us briefly? Do you have them right in front of you? Yeah, let me let me run through some. Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21. Isaiah 6, 11 and 12. Um, there's Isaiah 5, verse 9. Jeremiah 2, 15. Jeremiah 33, 10. For LDS audiences, uh, Doctrine and Covenants 115, verse 6. First Nephi mm-hmm. 17, 38. Um, mm-hmm. the, the list goes on. There's quite a few references to this idea of people fleeing, leaving, um, forsaking. And then later on in the scriptures, it talks quite a bit about those uninhabited cities and homes being inhabited once again, which is curious. Right, right. So they're going to be inhabited from anything from foreign troops to marauders, but later on re-inhabited by those very people that used to live in them. I have seen the house that I live in right now. There will come a point in time when I need to go to a place of safety that's not my current home, and then I will come back to it, and I've seen that I'll come back to it within seven to ten years after leaving my home, after the tribulations are over or towards the end of the tribulations, I will then be able to get to be able to return to my current home and residence that I live in right now. That brings me great comfort. Not everyone will be able to do that. Many people will have to forsake their home and all their belongings, and they'll have to be able to live in um, poverty for a long time and maybe rebuild in a new location. But some people will actually be called upon to return to their homes and rebuild their cities after we finish the war. Um, Thank you for those scriptures. Those are great. I hope you'll look them up, take some time. I just want to make one more comment for the LDS audience. For those that do not believe yet in the gathering or the gathering principle, I want to bring to your attention the very first book in the Book of Mormon where Nephi is talking about his goodly parents and his father Lehi, who had seen in dream and vision that the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. I, too, having experienced dreams and visions, seeing that that my city of Kansas City will be destroyed, I live about an hour south of here, have seen that the Lord has warned me and my family that there will come a time when I need to leave prior to that destruction or somewhat of the destruction, not the entire city of Kansas City will be destroyed, but it will also have plague and it will have a lot of uh, gangs and other things that come out into the suburbs. And so it will not be a very safe place for me to live for a time. And um, and I have a mission that's going to require that I go I, that I go west for a while before I come home. But if you look at the story in the Book of Mormon with Lehi, he flees with his family and he leaves, um, he leaves without much notice. He knew for a long time he was going to leave, but those in the city did not know that he was leaving and he did that purposefully. He fled um, at an hour when he could kind of leave without much recognition or people noticing that he was taking off. And he was not the prophet, you guys. 
Lehi at the time was not the prophet during that time. It was Jeremiah. I encourage our LDS audiences to go back and read your Bible. And this is not a judgment on my part, but what the Spirit has been telling me is that I need to encourage our LDS audiences to get back to their Bibles. They might be good at reading the Book of Mormon, but many of you are not reading your Bible, do not know your scriptures, and if you did, you would understand that Jeremiah was the prophet who lived in Jerusalem at the time, and Jeremiah was warning the people as well of their wickedness. He perished with his people. Jeremiah perished with his people, and that was his mission. Lehi was told to leave with his family, and they came to the Americas. I witness and testify of this truth. I have seen it in both vision and in dream, and I have been shown it in my NDEs when I experienced the window of heaven that's talked about in my book, the Great, uh, A Greater Tomorrow, which you can find on my website, julierealprepared.com. Go to julierealprepared.com, check out the books that are on there. You'll learn more about my story. I've got a blog on there. You can read some of the quotes that I've written. And you can go ahead down to the bottom of my first page on my home page and click on the Greater Tomorrow Relief Fund to learn more about the mission of, of the gathering and preparing people for when we have refugees coming through. I hope that you'll volunteer. I hope that you'll listen to this message and that you'll know that the Lord loves you. And no matter where you find yourselves, you can find rest in the Lord. And I say that in his name. We'll wrap this show up now. Thanks so much for this episode. And we'll talk to you guys again. We'll do another one soon.